Hanum, it's me, that gal who put the ghoul in the goulash. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Uh, now, for those of you looking to improve your drab, dreary looks, you can rest easy knowing that you don't have to waste thousands of dollars on painful plastic surgery to get people to like you. Instead, you can waste, I mean, invest thousands of dollars on latex rubber monster masks. That's right, hand-painted and covered with genuine synthetic hair. These over-the-head little beauties are guaranteed to make you the toast of any Halloween party. Or after your spouse finds out how much you spent on something that rots away in a few years, the dependent in a divorce settlement. <laughs> years, monsters have crawled out of their crypts, tombs, and graves to thrill and chill moviegoers. And one company has literally brought the creatures of the night face to face with horror film fans. Dawn Post Studios. Located in Glendale, California, the Dawn Post Studios has long been a mecca for monster makers and monster fans. After starting the company in 1939, Dawn Post became the first manufacturer of rubber masks in the United States. His early line included an assortment of animals, clowns, and other humorous characters. But in 1948, Don Post made a business decision that would impact the direction his company would take for decades to come. My dad went to Universal Studios and worked out a deal to, for a licensing agreement to make a Frankenstein mask. That mask was made for 20, 25 years. Modeled after the likeness of Glenn Strange, who played the monster in the last three of Universal's now classic Frankenstein films, the mask became a huge hit with fright fans of all ages. I went over to Bruce's Haunted House over in Glendale, and the guy hands me this beautiful box, this nice cardboard box. And it's pretty small. I'm thinking, a mask is in there? It's kind of weird. And I opened it, and of course, it pops right out, and there it is, you know? But this wonderful box art and thing for everything. And I thought, wow, this is too cool. And I put that mask on. I literally put it on, and I wore that with my bicycle riding home, and I got honks and people yelling. It was fun. Don Post was now the first official licensee of any Universal Studios monster. And it was only a matter of time before other Hollywood dream factories came knocking on his door. One thing Don did that most people don't know, he did a head of Alfred Hitchcock for one of the Hitchcock shows, and it looked exactly like Alfred Hitchcock. But of all the stuff he did, I think the thing he's most remembered for was Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original film. He did the big pods, which were wonderful. He did the bodies when they came out of the, the pods and were forming. Not only did he did the, the forming bodies, but he did the finished bodies with hair and everything else. But even though Don was now a successful Hollywood prop maker, he didn't stop releasing his signature line of horror-themed masks. In 1963, Don joined forces with a young mask maker named Vern Langdon, and together they literally changed the face of horror. When I came along, it was very easy. I pretty much had carte blanche, so I could put out just about anything I wanted, and I put out everything I wanted. With his enthusiasm and his love for monsters and everything, uh, he helped take things to uh, in a little bit different direction and to another level. Working together, Post and Langdon gave birth to a new line of latex masks and christened them the Hollywood Horrors. This line of false faces recreated such famous monsters as the Phantom of the Opera, the Mummy, Mr. Hyde, Dracula, and of course, Frankenstein's monster. Unfortunately, due to the instability of the latex used to make the mask, virtually none of these infamous faces exist today. This Dracula mask may be the sole survivor of Don Post's golden age of ghoul masks. 
Although time has taken its toll on this fearsome vampire, any fan can still appreciate the sculptor's attention to detail. In 1964, Universal Studios asked the company to create latex versions of their first family of fright, the Munsters. The movie studio was so pleased with Post's efforts that they renewed the mask maker's license for their classic monsters. The Hollywood horrors were retooled and eventually transformed into the newly rechristened Universal Horrors. With the help of talented sculptors Pat Newman, Don and Vern reimagined their original. Much of that fame was due to a series of ads in the pages of famous monsters of Filmland magazine. Boasting lifelike realism and genuine artificial hair, these masks came complete with optional claws and a monstrous price tag of nearly $40. Considering that the average kid's allowance in those days was 25 cents a week, it's no small wonder that the closest many FM readers came to owning the mask was in the form of photographs that illustrated a one-shot calendar issued in 1965. Don Post and Vern Langdon also continued to alter and improve their mask line to meet the ever-changing demands of their customers. In 1968, readers of Famous Monster magazine were introduced to yet another series of monster masks. This 800 line offered over-the-head masks at a third of the price of the Universal Horrors. Even with their sculpted hair and less detailed paint jobs, these masks remain highly collectible. It was around that time Don Post Jr. stepped in to join his father and helped develop an even broader range of monster masks than ever before. This trio of bell ringers from the Hunchback of Notre Dame really did strike a chord with Post customers in the 1970s. Dracula rose again from his grave in this more generic and unlicensed version of the fearless vampire. When Ape Mania hit the country in the 1970s, Post Studios offered this beautifully detailed series of masks which showcased the simian stars from Planet of the Apes. These popular creatures from Star Wars flew off of store shelves faster than you could say Luke Skywalker. And speaking of stars, this Captain Kirk mask became an icon with horror fans when it was repainted and used as the eerie disguise worn by serial killer Michael Myers in the low-budget slasher smash, Halloween. Sadly, on November 17, 1979, Don Post Sr. passed away, leaving his son to carry on the company's impressive legacy. Acknowledging the fact that the masks made by the company were now being prized as cherished works of art, Post Studios licensed the rights to create this impressive mask and hands from the 1979 remake of Nosferatu. Complete with a certificate of authenticity and this plexiglass case, this impressive likeness of Klaus Kinski in the title role went for a whopping $350. Remarkably, it is now worth over $2,000 to any collector lucky enough to find one. In 1982, the Halloween film franchise continued with Halloween 3, The Season of the Witch. The producers approached Don Post Studios to create the movie's main props three killer masks that would explode on their owners' heads on Halloween night. Of course, Post also released copies of the masks to monster fans that same year. But don't worry, even though the mask did come with the film's silver shamrock insignia, they were missing the exploding microchip. 1990 saw the release of these incredibly accurate gremlins from the Warner Brothers film Gremlins 2. 
To ensure that the likenesses would be as accurate as possible, Post hired one of the film's creature sculptors to recreate these little devils. Throughout the years, Don Post Studios has offered a gallery of ghouls that would be the envy of many a trick-or-treater. But what was Don Post's best-selling mask of all time? Believe it or not, it was this latex likeness of Swedish wrestler-turned-actor Tor Johnson. Tor Johnson was a regular face in a string of no-budget movies in the 1950s. But even Criswell couldn't have predicted the incredible popularity the actor continues to enjoy as a genuine horror icon. fans around the globe, the name Don Post is as famous as the monsters he created. Where there are no Don Post, there would be no rubber masks as we know them today. I firmly believe that. He was to masks what Walt Disney was to animation. Hey, whoever said looks aren't everything? <laughs> 